I'm sitting here with my friend, Francois Duplessis. Francois, we've known each other for 31 years? Almost, yes. Almost 31 years. And uh, there's something that we felt we needed to discuss. And uh, I think the world has the right to hear about the issue that we are going to discuss. Yes, we don't have the monopoly. We want to share this with the world. Exactly. Now, we're going to speak about what the Seventh-day Adventist Church calls the spirit of prophecy, the writings of Ellen G. White. And uh, she is such a bone of contention and such a thorn in the flesh of so many even within the circles of Adventism, that uh, perhaps it would be nice speaking to someone of uh, senior vintage <laughs> to see how the spirit of prophecy and the writings of Ellen G. White affected you. How did you become introduced to them? I can perhaps add that I too was confronted with the writings of Ellen G. White. And I mean, why do we need a prophet in adverted commas? Why do we need extra information? Isn't the Bible enough? Isn't that all we need? Tell us what happened after a phone call from a colleague. Well, I think people have heard that story already, but uh, when I accepted the biblical truths, I didn't even know about Ellen G. White. I never knew she existed. And then I got that phone call from my colleague, and he was so irate. And eventually, he used some explicits regarding Ellen G. White. And he was so adamant and so vociferous. <laughs> and uh, I was taken aback, and I thought, now, nah, What's he talking about? And then I started to investigate, and uh, the but first... But didn't the pastor who baptized you enlighten you about the subject? Don't you think that's important? It was never discussed. I don't know how it slipped through the cracks, but it was never discussed. Anyway, I got a hold of this book, and it was called The Desire of Ages. And I said, well, let's see what this is about, because the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And so I read The Desire of Ages, and uh, it changed something in me. Mm. It had a profound effect. Now, you've had a similar experience, haven't you? You know, I was a young man, and my dad took me out of school. He put me into the printing trade. And all I read was the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. For 10 years, this was my literature. And it changed me, Walter. It still changes me. She's got a way of giving you a hiding 
and a kiss afterwards. <laughs> Take the hiding and enjoy the kiss. Some people, when they get the hiding, they run away. But there's, there's a bomb in Gilead, there's a bomb in the messages, a warning. And I need that. I'm a wicked man. I must get somebody to give me a, a clout, you know. Now, isn't it amazing that this problem doesn't seem to go away uh, throughout the existence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? There have been critics of Ellen G. White, and many writings have appeared denouncing her as a false prophet. Like of old, the prophets were treated exactly the same. Yes, and uh, not only that, we seem to be escalating in that direction with many, many people turning their backs on the writings of Ellen G. White, not only uh, people within the church, but leaders even negate her writings. And so there seem to be two camps. And of late, some literature has also appeared that has put the writings of Ellen G. White in a very negative light. And uh, I think it's time that we discuss this issue quite frankly. Why should there be a prophet? Is it even biblical that there could be a prophet? Isn't the Bible enough? Isn't the canon complete? Is there something that has to be added to the canon? Is there, were always, there were always prophets next to the Holy Script. Always. So when it came to scripture, there were, there were prophets. Always. Read the Bible. <laughs> From Abram. And in the New Testament times? They were there. The daughters of Philip? Yes. The apostles themselves were prophets. So why negate a prophet in the last church? Now, biblically, Francois, is there a biblical criterion where you could address this issue and say, does the Bible have anything to say about the possibility of a prophet at the end of time? Yes. And you know, there are four major tests and seven physical tests of a prophet. We won't go into that. So the listener can, can look into this for himself. So because this is going to take half an hour. No, we don't have to go but into she, the detail. She passes all the tests that the prophet needs to be tested on. In both the spiritual, behavioral, physical aspects. Every aspect. Now, what is so amazing about Ellen G. White is that uh, she was the most unlikely candidate. Uh, she was only 17 years old. She had been injured as a young girl in a rather dramatic. She never received a PhD. No, she didn't have a PhD. She had three years of official schooling and uh, yet she became the most prolific female writer in modern history. And she has received acclaim from people within and people without this organization. One professor in one of our universities, a non-Adventist university, and he is a non-Adventist, he says to us, this is the best theology in the world. The best theology in the world. Her theology, yes. Now there are so many claims about Ellen White that she, uh, she never received those visions. I mean, she was 17 years old when she received her first Vision, correct? Of 2,000 more afterwards. Yes. Now, 17, isn't that very young for God to choose someone? I'm so glad he uses young people as well, Walter. If you think about it, how old was Daniel about when... 17. He was 17. Joseph. Joseph. How old was he? 17. 17. Uh, John. He was about 17. Yes, and the disciples too, they were young, young. They were young. Teenagers. And uh, so it is fascinating to me that she fits into that category. And then the, this claim that she was a plagiarist, 
that she wrote what others had written before her. And sometimes the similarities are so great that uh, there's no doubt that she used other material. Uh, how do you handle that issue, Francois? She was selective, led by the Holy Spirit. And Paul did the same. You know, beautiful words, sentences should be eternal, everlasting. There are, in fact, chapters in the whole Bible that are exact replicas and copies of previous chapters. Yes. So that would fall under the category of plagiarism. Now, and Paul using the philosophers, the Greek philosophers. Yes. Now, well, I worked at the university for many years and published quite a few papers and I've written some books. And if I had to look at those books, I would uh, estimate that 90% of what is written there is plagiarism. Yeah. Uh, not in the sense of legal plagiarism, but quoting other sources. And they also quoted other sources. And they also quoted other sources. And it goes back sources. and back and back. That's why there's a reference list, which is pages long, at the end of such a document. Now, in Ellen White's time, that wasn't the practice. Nobody did that. You can look at the old writings. There was no such thing. If you quoted someone, if you quoted uh, the Greek sages, there wasn't necessarily a quote. Paul does that. Paul quotes Epicurus and other philosophers in his writings, but there is no reference as to who he is quoting. I salute her for quoting these brilliant authors. And how did she know what to select from the various writings, given the, the confusion that exists out there? So when it comes to plagiarism, seeing that there were no such laws, one has to judge her writings from the contents, number one, uh, it is best not to read what, so much as to what is written about her as to read what she is writing. Now, Francois, in the time that she wrote, there was another female prophet on the planet. And you studied about this lady. Yes, and her name was Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. And... Uh, she wrote, she belonged to the Theosophical Society. So you have these two female figures, and Blavatsky became one of the most prolific writers, just like Ellen White. But in her writings, it is Lucifer who's exalted as the angel of light. Mm. And at the exact time, same time in history, you have Ellen G. White exalting the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So you have these two contrasting figures. I find it fascinating that they're both women, that they are contemporaries, and that they send two streams of information into the world. Was she a plagiarist? Well, she quoted much from other writers, and I'm sure that she didn't always uh, provide the source. But what is interesting to me is that when you read what people say out there and how they criticize Ellen G. White, and you compare this to what they do to Blavatsky and her protégés, her, the ones that followed her, like Alice A. Bailey and uh, all of these prophets that exalt the Luciferian light, that they are so accepted in the highest circles of the world, that there are whole organizations at the United Nations level, for example. Woe unto you, you usually, you usually say to me, when everybody speaks well of you, yes. quoting Solomon. So here are these organizations that use this, this wisdom. And you have this other prophet that seems so maligned. So, you know, it doesn't really bother me 
that she has such bad press, it makes me curious. Why would it be necessary for God to provide such guidance at the end of time? You know, she writes in her writings that she's not there to supersede the Bible. She's not the equivalent of the Bible. Yes, you're right. She says she's the lesser light pointing to the greater light. You know, Walter, the other night you took your binoculars and you looked at Orion. Yes. And you saw more beauty. To me, Ellen White is like a binoculars or a telescope. The starry heavens reveals more beauty. She takes the Bible and she gives us more beauty as we read it. She points us to the Bible. Yes, now one of the criticisms against her is that people say uh, she becomes the icon in the church and everything revolves around Ellen G. White. Shame, I wish it was like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and some people, let's admit it, use her like a club to batter people. And she warns some... against it. Yes, she warns against it. You know, Francois, I am fascinated by the parallels between Moses and Ellen G. White. Moses led the people out of Egypt. And uh, in Egypt, they had become confused. They had so many inputs, the religion of the Egyptians. And what they remembered from the verbal communications of the patriarchs. They even made two bull calves. Exactly. So they had confused their religion. And it was necessary for God to realign the compass. So when he took them out of Egypt, and Moses was their leader, then Moses wrote down uh, the movements of the children of Israel and the requirements of God, and he explained the plan of salvation in typology in those first five books of the Bible that he wrote. The Torah, the first five books. Plus Job. That's correct, but the Torah is the message of salvation in type. The book of Job is an additional message which uh, you know, explains many of the issues involved and how false worship gives you false perspectives and false views of God give you false perspectives. But the perspectives themselves were in the Torah. That's why Isaiah says, to the law, which is the Torah, and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. They have no light. So the Torah is basically the standard of what salvation is all about. It tells you about the origin. It tells you about sin. It tells you about the solution in type, in the sanctuary message. And such a large component of the Torah concerned the sanctuary. It had to be so precise. It had to be a pattern of the heavenly. And Moses had to confront many of the false ideologies. And I, <laughs> I like that statement, Francois, where he comes down from Mount Sinai and he says to, to Aaron, his brother, what is that I hear? Is it the sound of war? <laughs> and Aaron says, no, it's the sound of singing. <laughs> so it seems that he had a, had a problem with the, the noise they were making. And they were dancing around this golden calf. And he had to address all of these issues. And Moses had to confront errors in a very specific way. And of course, God directed him as to how to, to deal with these issues. And his brother was no exception. Exactly. His brother was no exception. He even rebuked his brother. 
and also Miriam. Yes. And uh, you, we know what happened there. And if you think about uh, all the rebellions against Moses. Korah. Korah's rebellion, Dayton, uh, Abiru, all of them. They were all recorded in the Bible. And as we know, as a consequence of, of what he was saying and what he was presenting, he was very popular. <laughs> well, let's rephrase that. He was exceedingly unpopular. As for this Moses, <laughs> we what not what has become of him. And they chose for themselves leaders to lead them back into Egypt. When we look at the Torah, and we look at the, uh, the way it is set up, the pattern of worship based on sanctuary verse worship. When we look at Leviticus, uh, the health message, we received a very specific health message as to what was allowed and what was not allowed in terms of uh, their diet. Uh, and, and these things were immensely popular. I mean, the people embraced it and loved it. No, they rebelled against it. They were furious. They longed for the flesh pots of Egypt. And when we take that situation and you take it into the time of the birth of the Advent movement, you have very distinct parallels. Mm. Uh, I mean, look at Protestantism. The Lord had directed those early reformers, and they had discovered the immense truth of salvation by grace through faith. And uh, they had paid such a heavy price for what they had discovered. And they were firm on their Christology and in what they believed. And, uh, I mean, they were so involved. Luther had written the Bible, and it, it spent so much time reuniting those uh, dialects and languages and making one specific language. And he must have mulled over every single verse. How do I translate this? And what is the meaning that I have to bring across in the new translation? And think about Tyndall, who had to do exactly the same thing. And then you look at their theologies and what they believed. And just a couple of hundred years later, how many denominations had suddenly appeared? And then you had all these Protestant denominations all over the world, each one with his own particular view, his own particular spin on the Bible. And you had basically the same situation that you had in the time of Moses. You had all these religions around you, and they all had different worship styles, and this appealed to the, the Israelites, and they incorporated it into their worship style. And then you have the story of, of Balaam, and uh, it's just, the parallel is so magnificent. And so God was gathering a people that was now coming out of this confusion, and he had to set the record straight. Wouldn't it be logical for God at a time when there was so much diversity in thinking, and there were so many denominations, and God was gathering a people out of the whole world to take them to anti-typical Canaan, that he would raise up a prophet to assist in determining what is syncretism and what is not, what is truth and what is error. How do we proceed? And I'm fascinated at the way in which it worked. Because when Alan White started to receive visions at the age of 17, and she had this traumatic life behind her, she was not the one who initiated any of these studies. These were the pioneers of the church. They sat down and they studied the word of God. And they tried to figure out where, 
where does the road lead? Where is it right? Where is it wrong? And when they came to an impasse and could go no further, that's when she received a vision. Now people say, were these false visions or were they true visions? And the five pillars of Adventism were discovered and they were the return of Jesus. Jesus is going to come again. The blessed hope. Yes, and how many views were there as to how he would come at that stage? I mean, there was a millennialism, the Roman Catholic view. There's going to be no millennium. The church is going to rule. Uh, there was pre-millennialism. There was post-millennialism. And depending to which denomination you belonged, you could uh, pick and choose as to what you wanted to believe. Who is going to set the record straight? The greater light. That's the Bible and the Bible alone, that greater light. But the greater light had been so confused, not the light itself, but the interpretation of the light, that how are you going to get back to what the Bible really says? So serious Bible study and confirmation and correction by the spirit of prophecy. The lesser light confirming the truth of the greater light. So the doctrine of the second coming was one of the major pillars. And then they had this disappointment because in their studies, they believed that Jesus was going to come again and they interpreted the prophecies of the 2300. And the earth had to be cleansed. And they believed that the earth had to be cleansed. And then the great doctrine of the sanctuary developed out of this disappointment. Now, Ellen White had visions about the sanctuary message. Now, Francois, you're a theologian. The Torah, isn't it all about the sanctuary? That's the heart of the story, right? Yes. Now, how is it possible that the sanctuary message had been lost sight of in such totality that nobody even recognized its significance. If it formed the heart of the Torah and every prophet has to be in harmony with the Torah, the testimonies have to harmonize with the Torah. Surely the sanctuary, which shows you the path of salvation, needed to be restored. And the spirit of prophecy was absolutely essential in that restoration. And that's where the great doctrine of the sanctuary and how it operated and how it served as a type of salvation and how Paul picks it up and talks about it and uh, describes the role of the high priest who is now in the heavenlies uh, that served as the pattern for the earthly. So that required a prophetic gift. And then... Can I come in on this Absolutely. point? When I studied the Sumerian language, yes. you know, Hapax Legomenon. What is that, Francis? Daniel 8, 13 and 14. It, it means this word only appears once, once. in the Bible. Yes. The sanctuary shall be cleansed. And I was sitting in this class and the professor, we were translating Ashur Bani Paul's Sumerian because he had a huge library. And here... I couldn't believe my eyes and my ears. It speaks of Enlil, the temple of Enlil. And it says the temple of Enlil, Enlil, should be cleansed. So you had that same terminology? <laughs> For the first time, I find a Hapax in in Sumerian literature. And that's the only place I found this, the sanctuary must be cleansed. Now, if it forms such an important part of the prophecy, then surely there should be a church that teaches it. Uh, the other point was, of course, that uh, they realized that you had to keep the Sabbath because the issue of law and grace had become so confused. What the reformers had taught seems to have been Last, Martin Luther was constantly fighting against antinomianism. The law has been done away with. 
But by the time of the development of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, antinomianism had its place in many denominations. And to this day, it has its place in mega church structures. So that which the reformers warred against had become the common practice in many, many denominations. And here you had to be brought back to the right relationship between law and grace. And the spirit of prophecy was a pivotal part, a central part in that restoration. And of course, the three angels' messages, they had to be preached. And you ask yourself, who preaches the three angels' messages? And it must be a very important message because it says to every tribe and nation and people and every tongue, this message must go out. A global message to each country in the world. That alone should be a criteria as to who qualifies as the final messenger because it has to bring that message. And to bring clarity to that message, the spirit of prophecy played a central part. And then the state of the dead. Martin Bel Luther believed that the dead sleep until the resurrection. Tyndall believed that the dead sleep until the resurrection. And the early pioneers, when they studied these issues, again, the spirit of prophecy played such an important part, not in addition to the Bible, but just highlighting those texts in the Bible. Francois, you give many Bible studies. Uh, do you say to people, this is what the spirit of prophecy says and you better believe it? Or do you quote one Bible verse after the other? What would you do? The telescope, I'll bring it in a little later, to see the beauty of the display of God's grace. In the Bible, the lesser light comes after you've discussed the, the great light. Now, when Moses rebuked the sins of all the individuals, <laughs> uh, his popularity took a dive. And I believe that uh, this unfortunate task, or this uh, difficult task, let me rather put it that way, also fell onto the shoulders of this frail person, Ellen G. White. And she had to address certain excesses and said, this is not in accordance with the way God has shown me it should be. It should be this way or that way. And uh, people were highly offended. And there were some magnificent cases where uh, she would reveal something that she couldn't have known at all. Months before the event occurred, or letters that she wrote from Australia. Now in those days, Francois, those letters had to be posted. They had to then be taken on board a ship that then had to sail for weeks across the ocean to arrive at another place. And then that letter would arrive exactly when the event described in that letter was taking place. I Miraculous. Mean, that is amazing. That is absolutely astounding. So you have these parallels. Moses wrote the Torah. God's people at the end of time needed testimonies to reset the compass to show which way God's people should go, how they should behave themselves, uh, what should be their deportment in worship, what style of worship should they have? Uh, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable? What about our external appearance? Was God particular about external appearance? What does the Bible say about that? You know, when he took them out of Egypt, they gave, God gave them a new day of worship, the Sabbath. The dress reform was there. They took off all the their jewelry and all of those things. And their things. diet, their diet changed. All right, so and, what and we, we have? should have this again. So if God did it to the Israelites, 
then if he is a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then shouldn't we have a similar experience at the end? So yes, there were excesses in dress and in ornamentation, let's put it that way, which were addressed. And do we have those same situations today? Definitely. So when you read about these excesses that are addressed, we have exactly the same excesses today. And if people are bent on adopting a particular worship style or dressing in a particular way, which is according to the scriptures and according to the spirit of prophecy, not uh, acceptable in terms of worship, then there will be sensitivities, won't there? Tremendous. Now, Francie, those uh, compatriots or those people that lived in the time of Moses that felt particularly offended when uh, their action was rebuked, they chose for themselves other leaders. And uh, take them back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Do we have parallels like that in the church today? The ecumenical phenomenon. So we want to go back to where we came from, when God was actually gathering a people and saying, come out of her, my people, I have a better way for you. A peculiar people. An and ancient as, word. And as Moses was the chosen one to correct those errors in his writings, and after him, the prophets, in harmony with what he had written, then I believe that it is absolutely essential that at the end, such a prophet should arise, because how would you find a final path amidst the confusion that is raging in the time that we are living in? And she's in harmony with all the prophets of the Bible. And then God was still so good as to give certain criteria in the Bible as to what a true prophet should really look like as opposed to a false prophet. And Francois, what do you yeah, say? Yeah, what the prophet prophesies should come out. Yeah, should come should, true, yes. Yeah. Uh, believe in Christ. It's, he sh the prophet should be Christ-centered. Absolutely. Believe the law. You know, these are just a few, and then there are physical ones as well. The prophet's eye should be open. Uh -huh. No breathing. So there are physical tests too. And Ellen White actually conforms 100% to every single one of those. I actually gave a lecture on that a couple of years ago, many years ago, called God's Guiding Gift. And Total onslaught? Uh, well, I, I don't know whether... Yeah, we could have been part of that series. But God's Guiding Gift gives all of those details and I actually wrote a chapter in the book that I wrote that was called Truth, Truth Matters. Matters. There's also a description of all of those manifestations. So we so don't have to go... the has access to it. Exactly. Now, Francois, your, your field of, of uh, expertise, that which you enjoy, which you love, is archaeology. And uh, in your experience, what fascinates you when you study in your particular field of interest, what fascinates you about the spirit of prophecy? You know, Walter, when you visit Samaria and you read what Ellen White says in her writings, she was not there. <laughs> I visited Babylon. She was not there. But the way she describes the site, the place, corresponds with uh, reality. With what you actually see there. At, at Nineveh. You know, next to the Euphrates, next to the Tigris, she describes the place. And when you get there, you see... She describes the place of the Exodus. You know, that is so marvelous. <laughs> she now, speaks... There, of, yeah. there, sorry uh, to interrupt. Are there any uh, other authors that seem to corroborate what she says in terms of these issues? Yes. In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, she describes the mountain protruding into the Red Sea. Yes. And, and that's the site where they crossed. 
And then you, you checked Josephus. I checked him on, on Noah as well. Josephus gave the same exact picture of the place. Francois, you have a great passion to show the world that the Bible is authentic. Isn't that what you do? Yes. And uh, what happens to your soul when you find something in the archaeology that confirms the scriptures? Recently, I phoned you and I told you about the latest discovery, Walter. I was so excited. It comes from the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel is a book that's not popular with everybody. But let's go but to... For very particular reasons. Yes, yes. And you cannot appreciate the revelation without understanding Daniel. And it's interesting that Martin Luther said that we should study the book of Daniel. By the way, it's the first book he published. The very first one. Yes. Of, of the Old Testament. Yeah. If you could turn to Daniel chapter 5, verse 31, and chapter 6, verse 1. Let's see what it says. Well, Daniel chapter 5, verse 31 says, And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. So what is your point here, Francois? The Bible says he received the kingdom. In other words, he received the Babylonian kingdom. There was a merge between him and Cyrus, the Medes and the Persians. Now, this is what the Bible says. And because they couldn't trace the name Darius the Mede in ancient literature, because they were heavy on Herodotus, they rejected this. Now, who was Herodotus? Herodotus was a, a, a historian, and he distorted the image of Cyrus. I went through his works. He is very, he, he pinches is he negative He's towards Cyrus? negative. Cyrus. Yes. The other source by Xenophon gives us a profile of a type of Christ. So who do you think I rely on? And by the way, Herodotus stops with the, 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 the royalty at, at a certain point, whereas Xenophon carries on right to the time of Darius the Mede. But listen what the lesser light says about this situation. We read in the book Prophets and Kings, page 523, Babylon was besieged by Cyrus, nephew of Darius the Mede, and commanding general of the combined armies of the Medes and Persians. Now, this one word, nephew, Walter, when I saw it, the entire picture just full fell together. Why? What, what is the issue? What did uh, Herodotus have to say about Cyrus, for example? No, he was negative. He was negative. He, was big. he also said that, <clears throat> that Cyrus conquered the Median Empire. But the Bible says nothing about that. No. No. And here she says that uh, Cyrus was actually related to Darius. Yes. Well, that changes the yeah. picture entirely. Darius the Mede was his uncle. And it also says that he was the general of the combined armies. And this is what the Xenophon says. Ah, so Xenophon supports this. Yes. Well, the, for about four weeks now, I've been studying the reliability of the Bible concerning Darius the Mede. Uh -huh. In conjunction with what Ellen White says about this man and what the Bible says about Cyrus the Great as well as Darius the Mede. Now, when they disprove Daniel, this entire chapter with its message, falls apart. This is eschatology. This is Daniel coming from the lion's den. So, Francois, we need that lecture. 
It's, it's coming. Walter, I'm so excited. So in other words, what you are saying, the world criticizes the book of Daniel based on the mentioning of Darius the Mede, if you want to use the American pronunciation of his name, then it also brings into, into play the relationship between Darius or Darius and Cyrus, and that they were actually related. And the Bible speaks about the Medo-Persian Empire. Cyrus did not destroy the Medes. It was his family. It was his family. So he actually, in him, they were united, the Medes and the Persians. Yes. You know, he actually gave Darius, his uncle, Darius the Mede, the palace in Babylon. And Darius the Mede gave Cyrus his daughter. So you are telling me, Francois, that the lesser light is shining on the greater light, the Bible, and showing us that the Bible is not only true, but relevant for our time. Is that what you're saying? Now, yes. you know, Francois, your research was in the field of archaeology. Now, my research was in the field of nutrition. And I discovered many things in the spirit of prophecy that piqued my interest. And I based my entire research at the university on some of these issues. You know, she talks about uh, combinations of foods. She talks about what is healthy and what is not healthy. She talks about uh, abuse of substances, uh, the effects of certain drinks such as coffee and tea, and what it does to the mind. Now, just as Moses gave a health message, so here we have a health message. What a parallel. And I actually tested it in the laboratory. And mm. I used my students to do research projects to test some of these, these issues. What I'm saying is that the spirit of prophecy has been vindicated every single time. Mm. Now, I don't want to repeat the lectures on, on health and the spirit of prophecy because they've been done already. So the viewers can, can look at the material. I mean, uh, lectures such as Path of Obedience, where there are many Ellen White texts and the history of these scientific facts or uh, food for thought, what happens when you eat and what does it do to your mind. But there are certain things, Francois, that I find rather interesting in the spirit of prophecy. Uh, for example, electricity. She writes, there is life in the seed, there's power in the soil, but unless an infinite power is exercised day and night, the seed will yield no returns. The showers of rain must be sent to give moisture to the thirsty fields. The sun must impart heat. And then this fascinating little interjection, electricity must be conveyed to the buried seed. Electricity. Now, there are many statements such as this. She talks about the electrical system in the body and all of these issues. And then the life which the Creator has implanted, He alone can call forth. Every seed grows, every plant develops by the power of God. Now, I was fascinated when I read that. Now, I didn't do any research on it myself. But uh, Iowa State University has an interesting publication. It's from the late 60s. Effects of various electrical fields on seed germination. Mm. Now, in this study, they show that the electrical fields uh, have certain potential differences, of course, between the atmosphere and the soil, and that this has a very profound effect on seed germination. Now, this is not a, a science that comes from her time. This is, you know, new stuff that has uh, been discovered. And she has many, many such statements. She says, for example... Uh, as you mentioned, not a morsel between meals. 
And uh, you yourself uh, did that in your life, I think. You applied that. Can you tell us about when that? When I was 21 years old, I read this statement. And I said, Lord, I want to live this truth. Yeah, now she makes a statement like that and you wonder why. But research has shown that since you, you, know, you produce the enzymes in specific glands and store them there for when you are eating, and whether you eat a large amount or whether you eat a small amount, uh, that will be released. So if you're snacking constantly between meals and then you finally get to your real meal, then your, your glands are exhausted and you do not provide the correct amounts of, of enzymes to digest your food, which leads to fermentation, which leads to an acid system. I mean, there's, there's method in, in what she's and saying. you become a dyspeptic. Exactly. Or she says, uh, you must have at least three grains in your diet or in a meal. You mustn't just uh, have one item. And uh, she talks about the value of legumes. Now, I tested that actually in the laboratory. What is the difference? We looked at the amino acid analysis of the various grains. Mm. And grains are not complete proteins. That means they do not have sufficient quantities of all the essential amino acids that you need in your diet. But it's fascinating that if you combine three grains, you will have them all. Or if you combine a grain with a legume, you will have them all. So it's just fascinating to me that a person who really shouldn't have known anything about these issues should have been so accurate. But then, of course, she also has statements which irk people. <laughs> and uh, she rebukes uh, partaking in so many refined sweet foods. And the medical world will tell you today that uh, that is the reason why we have so many diabetics in the world and why there are so many obese people in the world. And uh, I mean, the world knows about that. But here's a statement that is rather fascinating. You should be teaching your children. You should be instructing them how to shun the vices and corruptions of this age. Instead of this, many are studying how to get something good to eat. You place upon your tables butter, eggs, and meat, and your children partake of them. Hmm. Now, the original diet in the Bible was totally vegetarian, vegan vegetarian. And nobody ran around uh, killing animals to eat them. There was no death. And even after sin, what was introduced was the plants of the field that the, that the animals ate. And originally, the animals were all plant eaters, every single one of them. And the Bible says that they will return to that state. The book of Isaiah tells us that the lion will eat straw again like the ox. They will not hurt, they will not destroy in all his holy mountain which is in his kingdom. So that diet will be restored. So she claims that the vegetarian diet, particularly the vegan diet, because she says God commandment keeping people will not eat anything that comes from an animal because disease is increasing in proportion to the wickedness of man. And we can see the zoonotic diseases increasing. And so this statement just takes us back to what the Bible says, and to a lesser extent in his time, what Moses told the people. And then it says, they are fed the very things that will excite their animal passions. That's also a fascinating statement. Eggs the things that will feed their animal passions, eggs, milk, butter, cheese, those things. You know, there have been experiments in, uh, in prisons where people are placed on a, on a plant-based diet and the other group receives the normal diet and uh, the aggression in the two groups is just phenomenally different. And in some prisons which were maximum security prisons, by changing the diet, you could change the behavior of the people to such an extent that you could dispense with many of those stringent rules. 
So they are fed the very things that will excite their animal passions. And then you come to the meeting and you ask God to bless and save your children. How high do your prayers go? Now, a statement like that offends people because they eat that. Of course, God takes into account the knowledge that you have, the time of ignorance God winks at. You always talk about that. And uh, of late, there have been some publications which say that this cannot be from God. Well, was Moses' vision on health from God, Francois? Or was it not? Definitely. Definitely. So uh, these are the issues that uh, create enemies. And some people, on the basis of a statement like that, which is actually just supporting what Scripture has to say on diet in the first place. And this is for our benefit. It's for our benefit. Of course, if you know, Francois, and you do it not, what does the Bible say about that? You will receive many stripes if you know much. Uh -huh. So knowledge is something that you have to apply. So I find it fascinating that there are uh, so many negative things written about the spirit of prophecy just on the basis of it rebuking the lifestyles, uh, the activities, the dress, or anything that goes along with that. But you know what, Francois? Besides all of these issues, what she says on health, what she says on Whatever subject touches our lives, there's one thing that stands out to me above all the others. Christology. And that is her Christology. Mm. So I think we should concentrate on that aspect. Mm.